and gentlemen, welcome to Clinical Journal Club for this week. We'll get right on it. Uh, this is the image in the New England Journal. Uh, it concerns an 84 year old woman who shows up with this painless red nodule on her fourth finger on her right hand. No idea. Actually, I thought it looked a little bit like a pyogenic granuloma. Um, basal cell carcinomas don't occur on the hands to my knowledge. Sporotrichosis is a fungal infection from, that occurs in gardeners. I don't think it looks like that. This is not a furuncle. It doesn't look like a pustule. Uh, so the worst possible diagnosis is Merkel cell carcinoma. There are two bad skin cancers malignant melanoma and Merkel cell carcinoma. And in the quizzes, I generally tend to pick the worst diagnosis, and that's correct. Merkel cell carcinoma is an aggressive cutaneous neuroendocrine tumor, and there's very good evidence that it's associated with a polyoma virus. So this is another example of a viral-induced malignant disease. And it requires, unfortunately, a fairly broad incision and the poor woman lost her finger. So here's some more information on this skin tumor. It is also associated with exposure to ultraviolet radiation, although the polyoma virus association was discovered in 2008 and you can stain for these sorts of things. This lesion on this woman's ear, the tumor occurs in older persons, is rather similar to what we saw on the finger. Now, the first topic of the New England Journal is breast cancer screening, and that's done with mammography. A mammography seems to be pretty good, although some countries like Switzerland, for instance, are not convinced that breast cancer should be screened at all because the evidence that breast cancer screening causes women to live longer is not robust. But women and uh, patient groups and uh, advocate groups uh, have their own opinions on this matter. Now, one of the problems with the conventional radiographic screening for best, breast cancer is that it is less sensitive in women that have dense breasts, which is generally the case in younger rather than older women. And so women that have dense breasts one possibility is to study them with magnetic resonance imaging, which is substantially more expensive and uh, problematic, uh, particularly with conventional scanners. Uh, three Tesla MRIs are not conventional in most hospitals. Then there's the thought that, well, we'll find some lesions and they may be indeed malignant or classified as malignant today, such as ductal carcinoma in situ, but if these are removed, it's not entirely clear that the women are done a favor. How do you determine the density of breasts? Well, there's a scale for this, breast density scales, and uh, we can see four different examples here. This woman's breasts are entirely fatty. Here's scattered fibroglandular material, uh, this breast is so hetero is heterogeneously dense, and this breast woman uh, this woman's breast is very dense according to this Volpara scale. So in this particular study, which was done in the Netherlands, forty thousand women with extremely dense breasts, that is to say, three to four on the Volpara scales, were invited into a study in which they were randomized to two groups. One group received mammography only, and if declared to be negative, that is normal mammograms, were then evaluated two years later. Uh, that are, that's this 32,000 woman in this arm. All of them had dense breasts and were negative on the first mammography screening. Now, 8,000 women with dense breasts but negative mammography screening were randomized to MRI. And um, about half of them showed up, about almost 5,000 showed up, to actually showed up for the MRI screen to which they were invited. And this was done with a three Tesla scanner. Now, of the 5,000 women that underwent MRI screening, 
79 of them um, had a suspicious lesion and eventually were received the diagnosis of breast cancer. And in the women that uh, didn't undergo MRI, obviously none of them received the diagnosis of breast cancer until they were followed up two years later. And what we can see from this distribution is that eventually the number of women that were shown to have breast cancer was less than the MRI uh, that had at two years later was less than the MRI group compared to the conventional group, implying that the MRI detected some breast cancers that would uh, not have shown up uh, had the women not undergone MRI testing. A little complicated to swallow all of this business, uh, but here are the patients. Uh, 4,783 women actually underwent MRI. Mammography only group, 32,000 uh, women, uh, where they were from and uh, urbanization and socioeconomic status and these various things are shown here. I don't think that that's necessarily relevant to this particular study. Uh, intention to treat analysis. And uh, what we see is that uh, the interval cancer rate uh, was uh, higher after two years in the women that only underwent mammography compared to the women that also underwent MRI screening because the MRI presumably picked up some cancers that would not have been picked up had MRI not been done. And that basically is the conclusion that's reached in this particular study. Uh, so what we see here is that the positive predictor value of a positive MRI scan uh, was in essence 17%, which means that 300 women, uh, women underwent a breast biopsy. And in these women uh, that underwent breast biopsy, um, 79 were diagnosed with cancer, 64 with invasive breast cancer, and um, 15 with DCIS. So this is a complicated study. The screening detected tumors that were smaller on average, as we could imagine. MRI is probably more sensitive to find small tumors. Among the MRI participants, the absolute in incidence of invasive ductal and lobular cancers was higher than in the mammography only group, presumably because MRI was able to detect these tumors. The absolute incidence of node negative and early stage cancers was also higher among the MRI participants. Presumably, if tumors are found in an early stage, they will have not yet undergone metastases. And um, so the bottom line, I suppose, is for women with dense breasts, if they undergo MRI screening with a three Tesla scanner, some additional tumors will be found. Whether or not these findings will result in less women dying of breast cancer, this study can't answer that question. And what these findings will mean for medical practice also is unclear. So this is sort of a graphic uh, review of what we find here. The primary endpoint, uh, after two years of uh, mammography screen one to mammography screen two, uh, there are less cancers in the MRI group because the MRI picked up some compared to mammography alone. And this primary endpoint is uh, reduced about 50%. Um, so um, uh, the MRI in the meantime picked up smaller tumors at an earlier stage, more likely node negative than mammography alone. Does this really help these women? This study cannot answer that question. The next topic at the, in the New England Journal was is status epilepticus. Uh, um, this is a clinical diagnosis, and it's defined as people that don't respond to lorazepam and are still seizing after 30 minutes. Now, when I learned this in medical school, 
uh, we refer to grand mal epilepsy uh, that's shown in this uh, electroencephalogram shown here, uh, which is a dramatic condition. We learned the clinical manifestations of grand mal epilepsy from this little jingle here. I'm sorry that it's a bit obscene. And uh, these patients were then treated with anti-epileptic drugs. And the drug of choice today is lorazepam. And the patients that are still seizing 30 minutes later are defined as having status epilepticus. Although, although the diagnosis of epilepsy has changed a little bit in the last 50 years, and I'm not certain that all of these patients actually had grand mal epilepsy the way that I was taught the condition to be clinically. Now, exactly what to do with patients that don't respond to lorazepam isn't entirely clear. So these patients still seizing after 30 minutes clinically, they, this wasn't an electroencephalographic diagnosis, uh, were randomized to three possible additional treatments. Levotiracetam, uh, it's uh, uh, gamma amino butyric acid um, agonist, phenytoin, which basically is, as I understand it, is a metabolized to phenytoin, uh, which uh, works by dealing with voltage-dependent gated sodium channels, and valproic acid, which also addresses sodium and calcium channels. And the structure of these three agents is shown here. So in this randomized trial of patients with status epilepticus that had not responded to lorazepam, uh, these patients were randomized to these possible treatments. Uh, the eligibility, uh, the, the spectrum of epilepsy has changed since I went to medical school where most of the people with grand mal epilepsy that we saw were people that didn't take their drugs or epileptic seizures that were associated with alcohol intake. They're, so I've detailed the eligibility criteria that were applied in this study here, and also the patients that were excluded for this particular, uh, from this particular study. And uh, the limitations that the authors um, uh, conceded in their interpretation of these data. So here are the patients, 4, 400 epileptic patients were randomized to these various treatments. And um, then conclusions were drawn in terms of their response. So these epileptic patients are mostly younger individuals and half of them were black and half of them were white and there were some Hispanics and uh, the final diagnosis and about over nine, about almost 90% of these patients was indeed that they had uh, status epilepticus. Uh, some of them had some other forms of spells that I wouldn't have recognized as being grand mal epilepsy. And uh, here's their lorazepam dosage uh, that, and uh, what they had received before arrival to the study centers. So this is then the intention to treat population and uh, primary and secondary outcomes. And what we see here, uh, the primary outcome is whether or not the seizures stopped and uh, secondary outcomes, admissions to the intensive care unit and how long they stayed in the intensive care unit, et cetera. And by just perusing this table, we can see uh, that the three treatments were equally efficacious or not so if you want to look at it in a negative way. So here are the patients with treatment success and the random, here's, here are the bell-shaped distributions of phenytoin, levetiracetam, and valproic acid and uh, the three uh, treatments were not significantly different in terms of treatment success. And in those patients that didn't have treatment success, then they received alternative, one of the other drugs or some alternative treatment. And the safety analysis looks like the three treatment forms are similar in terms of adverse events. Purple glove syndrome, 
This occurs with phenytoin, and it looks like this. And fortunately, the purple glove syndrome didn't appear. This is a local reaction, and it's a major uh, problem with, uh, well, it's not a major problem because it didn't even occur in this study, uh, but it's a defined risk that's involved with the parenteral administration of phenytoin, and here's what it looks like. So, um, in conclusion, these three treatments were similar in efficacy in patients with status epilepticus. The next disease that we're going to consider is neuromyelitis optica. And I was taught that this is uh, basically a multiple sclerosis kind of disease that involves the optic nerve. That's basically correct, although this is a spectrum of diseases that can also involve the central nervous system and cerebrospinal cord. About two thirds of these patients have an antibody against the aquaporin-4 receptor. And exactly, exactly what the pathogenic role of these antibodies and how they work is not entirely clear. Uh, but basically, if, you look at, if we look at these patients' eye grounds, they look like they have papillitis. Uh, this actually would also be consistent with uh, cerebral edema. Uh, doesn't look like uh, malignant hypertension because there are no hemorrhages or exudates, otherwise that diagnosis would have occurred to me. But this is what the papillitis looks like through an ophthalmoscope. Now the drug that was applied in this randomized control trial uh, doesn't address the aquaporin-4 story, it addresses IL-6 which is a mediator of inflammation. And this antibody is called satralizumab, and it binds to the IL-6 receptor and impairs IL-6 signaling, uh, which is a cascade that's involved in severe inflammatory reactions. So these patients were randomized to, to satralizumab or placebo. And as we see here, about two thirds of them had antibodies against aquaporin-4. Otherwise, the patients were similar in distribution in this randomized study. And what we see here is that the, in the general study, the satralizumab uh, treated patients had a freedom from relapse that was better than placebo. And it looks fairly impressive, but what's even more impressive is the amongst the patients that had antibodies against aquaporin-4, they did even better with satralizumab compared to placebo. And in the patients that were negative in terms of antibody to aquaporin-4, uh, there was no advantage to receiving this IL-6 receptor antibody. Now, the numbers here are too small to draw major statistical conclusions because this condition isn't that common, uh, but just glancing at these data, uh, that's what the outcome looks like. So um, the key secondary endpoints, uh, look at this table in some more detail. Uh, there are some statistically significant differences here, uh, implying that this antibody against IL-6 receptor is efficacious. It seems to be particularly efficacious in the patients that have these antibodies against aquaporin-4. Uh, safety seems acceptable, uh, no deaths, some problems with infection, we mount inflammatory responses for good reason. Um, but uh, in these patients that are otherwise confronted with blindness, um, this antibody seems to be an acceptable risk, uh, particularly in patients that mount an antibody against aquaporin-4. The next topic in the New England Journal is pulmonary embolism. And we've, uh, in my career, the diagnostic possibilities here have dramatically improved. Uh, first of all, antibodies against um, fibrin breakdown products, D-dimers, or uh, determining uh, D-dimers has uh, uh, certainly altered the diagnostic possibilities in terms to be, of who's to be evaluated further. What's also helped is scores that address the probability of risk. Uh, 
And if we combine the well score and the D-dimer determination, we can probably figure out which patients should undergo CT in order to diagnose pulmonary embolism. Uh, CT costs money. Uh, it's also quite a bit of irradiation. So we would like to uh, uh, curtail our evaluations in those patients that have a higher risk of having pulmonary embolism compared to those that do, do not. And uh, we can look at the well score. Uh, is there an alternative diagnosis? Uh, are there clinical signs of deep vein thrombosis? Has the patient been immobilized? Is he spitting up blood? Does he have cancer? So we can address the clinical picture in terms of a clinical pretest probability of high risk, intermediate risk, or not very likely. And if we combine that with D-dimer determinations, then we should be in a fairly reasonable status in terms of making a decision who needs CT or not. And so in this particular Canadian study, patients were divided into those with low clinical pretest probability that had a D-dimer of less than 500 nanograms per milliliter. Then there were patients that had um, a D-dimer between 500 and 1,000 nanograms per milliliter. That's with a moderate clinical pretest probability. And all other patients went, uh, received CT. And what the investigators then did at a later date, some months later, uh, three months later, looked to see in terms of um, how many pulmonary episodes of pulmonary emboli did these two strategies miss uh, in terms of uh, um, making the diagnosis. So there are 2,000 patients with symptoms or signs of pulmonary embolism. 218 had a moderate clinical pretest. Uh, 1,700 had a low clinical pretest. Uh, these 47 that had a high risk went to C uh, CT immediately. And the patients that had a moderate risk uh, went to CT if they had a D-dimer uh, greater than 500. And the patients that had a low risk went to CT if they had a D-dimer greater than 1,000. And the patients that had values less than that uh, were then subsequently observed. And what we can see here from glancing at, these tab uh, at the table here, uh, this seemed to be a pretty good separation in terms of identifying patients with a low risk of having pulmonary embolism. And um, um, so the findings in this study established that the risk of considering pulmonary embolism to be ruled out or unlikely, and patients that have a low pretest and that have a D-dimer value less than 1,000, their chances of having, a, having had a pulmonary embolism despite our decision is extremely low. And those that have a moderate pretest, if their D-dimer is less than 500, we probably don't need to send them to CT. The review in the New England Journal is on essential thrombocyte, uh, thrombocythemia. Now, these are the patients that show up. Most of these are older patients that show up with a platelet count greater than a million. And then the question is, what do we do with these patients? These patients have some risk of developing a myeloproliferative disorder in the future. They have some risk of having stroke or some thrombotic complication, which wouldn't occur in people that have a platelet count that's normal. And what do we do with these patients? And um, this can be a problem. We can do genetic testing to see if they have a JAK2 mutation or some other, or a mutation in the gene encoding calreticulin. Those are the patients that have a higher risk of progressing to some sort of myeloproliferative disorder. Then should we give these people aspirin? Does that really help them? And if so, how much aspirin should they get? So that's the topic in this particular review. And so uh, essential thrombocythemia, uh, major criteria, platelet count greater than 450,000, 
patients commonly have a platelet count of a million. Should we send them off for gene testing for JAK2 or calreticulin mutations? Uh, should they be tested for polycythemia rubra? Well, I guess we would pick that up on CBC. Uh, what about the patients that have a breakpoint cluster region Abelson tyrosine kinase translocation? Uh, those are the patients that might develop chronic myeloid leukemia. Uh, these are all considerations, but we can't do gene tests on everybody. Which patients should undergo bone marrow evaluation? to make a distinction between these conditions. And that's discussed by this um, clever person that knows all about these things. It looks to see, it looks, seems to be that low dose aspirin is the way to go. And then we can establish a, a risk criteria for patients with very low risk or low risk. And then we can make a decision of whether or not cytoreductive therapy should be administered with hydroxyurea or some other agent. Then there are those few patients that have a high risk that require a closer follow-up. So that's the, basically the topic uh, in, this, and, in this review. Found this condition to be relatively common in older patients we saw in the clinic. The next review in the New England Journal is on genome sequencing during a patient's journey through cancer. Uh, the title of this review implies that having cancer is almost like being on vacation. It's not quite that wonderful. Although now it's possible uh, with massive parallel sequencing to sequence the entire tumor and also to sequence the patient. And we can then compare the cancer genome uh, to the patient's own genome. And then one can see at a glance what sort of mutations have shown up in the cancer. Uh, this is possible. Is this helpful? And that's discussed in this particular review. Uh, all the various things that can be found here are listed on the left. Uh, what we can also learn from sequencing the genomes of these cancers is what uh, we can uh, accrue environmental risk. You can pick up the people that have been smoking although you could look in their pocket and may perhaps make the diagnosis also, uh, find chemo-resistant driver mutations. Then there's the possibility of sequencing these cancers sequentially multiple times during a patient's cancer journey, as it's called in the title here. Uh, and what happens in these tumors is more and more mutations continually show up. Does this help us therapeutically? Uh, the discussant seems to think so. And uh, what will happen here in the future? I admit that we can sequence the genome for a $1,000, but the patients have to pay much more than $1,000 to have their tumors sequenced. That's also an issue. So this is the, the direction that personalized medicine is running. Here's the poor infant last week that had uh, congenital syphilis. Uh, here we can see the tibial periostitis and the development of a shape, saber shin. Now this lesion here was stained for treponema and we can see them here, uh, but with antibiotic treatment, happy to announce that all this went away. The next topic in the New England Journal is a woman, is an older woman who had pelvic inflammatory disease. Earlier, this was invariably a sequel of gonorrhea. And in the 1930s, two clinicians described a condition in which patients with pelvic inflammatory disease showed up with symptoms of gallbladder disease. And on surgery, the gallbladders looked okay, but these fibrous adhesions were found that were responsible for their right upper quadrant pain, shoulder pain, and other manifestations that suggest gallbladder disease. The, pay, uh, the physicians were named Fitzhugh and Curtis. And this condition of right upper quadrant adhesions after pelvic inflammatory disease is called the Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome, described in the 1930s. I learned this in medical school. I doubt it's taught today. Now, with modern imaging, we don't need to operate on the gallbladder to make this diagnosis.
one can see it. This is a CT. Uh, there are some adhesions shown here uh, that suggest the possibility of the Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. Then the patient in the New England Journal is a 20 month old boy who shows up uh, not doing well. He's coughing and has upper respiratory symptoms and shows up in the emergency room and has a hemoglobin of less than three and his hematocrit is nine. Also remarkable is a white cell count of 33,000. And these finders, findings are not a harbinger of anything good. And we can look at his CBC and uh, uh, He'd already been seen in another hospital. Here's, here his hemoglobin is 2.2 and his hematocrit is 7%. He's got 36,000 white cells, so he must have leukemia. His platelet count is normal. His reticulocyte count is far too low for this hemoglobin at 2.2. And as we can imagine, he's breathing, breathing 44 breaths per minute. Saturation is okay. So the red cells that he makes can are capable of carrying oxygen, uh, and he has a third heart sound, uh, but a 20-month-old infant with a hemoglobin of three, I would expect that he has a third heart sound. No murmur was heard. Uh, on evaluation of his skin, he has cafe au lait spots, and he has angular freckling. Uh, whether or not he has axillary freckling wasn't mentioned, and actually, a picture of his cafe au lait spots was not given in this report, but I'll show you one later. Here's his electrocardiogram. And what we can see here, he's got right bundle branch, right bundle branch block. So his R prime spike is higher than his initial R wave and V1, showing that the terminal vector is right and anterior. And his chest X-ray, Actually, this is an AP chest X-ray probably done in the emergency room. It's not so great, but it looks like he has cardiomegaly. Echocardiogra echocardiography is done, and he has a patent for Amino Valley, um, but that's not his primary problem. So the discussant tells us about all these things and what should be done with him, this youngster. I would think that fluid expansion in this child with a third heart sound and it sounds like he's in heart failure that has a hemoglobin of uh, less than three is probably not the way to go. I would prefer transfusion and that should be considered early in this patient. Certainly agree. Uh, supplemental oxygen, the discussion says that the most critical intervention is the administration of supplemental oxygen. I don't really buy that because this young, uh, this pro, uh, this child's problem isn't uh, his saturation is 100 percent, and uh, the amount of oxygen that would be uh, dissolved in his plasma is trivial. He needs more carriers, so the administration of red cells, I would think, is the more important treatment. Uh, blood loss, no evidence for that. His a, a reticulocyte count is 1%, despite the hemoglobin of less than three. Is this red cell destruction? I don't think so. Is this decreased red cell production? That could be, but I wouldn't think that iron deficiency and vitamin B12 deficiencies are responsible here. And then what the clever discussant uh, next tells us about is um, cafe au lait spots. And is this the McCune-Albright syndrome? I don't really think so. No evidence of bone disease. Uh, or is this neurofibromatosis type 1? Well, you might ask his parents, but he's being raised by an aunt, and the fam familial fa the family picture is difficult, and his parents are uh, nowhere to be found, so we can't look to see if they have coffee, cafe au lait spots or axillary freckling. So axillary freckling or freckling in the groin, that was present. Cafe au lait spots, that was present. And a leukemia, that was also present. That indicates that this youngster might have neurofibromatosis type one, which is a high risk for malignant disease, particularly myelomonocytic leukemia. And that's basically what this poor youngster has. 
and uh, here, here's his peripheral smear, and here, here are leukemic cells, and as a bone marrow evaluation, and uh, various markers here that are beyond my ken, but the staining for these is po uh, positive. And then he has a conventional cytogenetic analysis, all of these sequencing. And you can look at this on your own, uh, but these are various variants that uh, also occur. And uh, he's got two pathogenic mutations in neurofibromin 1, indicating that he has neurofibromatosis type 1. The only treatment that's available here is bone allergenic bone marrow transplantation. They took out this youngster's spleen as a supportive measure. Presumably, he was also vaccinated against pneumococci. And um, uh, the bone marrow transplant seemed to help him. So I wanted to show you some cafe au lait spots. And these are cafe au lait spots. And the only two diagnoses I know are neurofibromatosis 1 and um, the McCune-Albright syndrome, which is basically a bone disease. And what we do in these patients is we look for axillary freckling and freckling in the groin, not an area of high ultraviolet light exposure. And if we see freckles here, it should raise suspicion for the possibility of presence of cafe au lait spots and neurofibromatosis type 1, which is associated with a number of malignant diseases, but also myelomonocytic leukemia. The next topic is in the Lancet, and it concerns the treatment of osteoarthritis. And in people my age, this is common, particularly in the hands, and it can be debilitating. And what these Dutch investigators ask here is, can we treat these people with 10 milligrams of prednisone for eight weeks, and does it help them, or should they strictly rely on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and whatever else we do for osteoarthritis. Well, the first thing that we have to do is make the correct diagnosis and separate osteoarthritis from rheumatoid arthritis and carp carpal tunnel syndrome. Now, in rheumatoid arthritis, we might see some peripheral joint involvement, but I would expect that these metacarpal joints here would be involved in rheumatoid arthritis, which uh, isn't emphasized on this particular picture, but osteoarthritis is um, the terminal phalanges, Heberden's nodes, those are the things that are involved here. And it should certainly be able to distinguish these kinds of lesions from carpal tunnel syndrome. So half the patients got prednisolone, 10 milligrams, and the other half got placebo. And indeed, uh, they did a bit better. And when this was then reduced in dosage or discontinued, they received return to baseline values. And the side effects from this treatment seem to be acceptable. Uh, Non-serious -ad adverse events were few and not different amongst the two groups. And so the investigators conclude that yes, we can give patients with digital osteoarthritis, arthritis, osteoarthritis a temporary course of 10 milligrams of prednisone and they might be helped. The next investigation in the Lancet is an exploratory investigation, not a randomized controlled trial. And we are concerned here with tricuspid insufficiency. We know that patients with mitral insufficiency can benefit from mitral valve clips placed. Uh, is that also the case for tricuspid insufficiency? Well, the first thing we have to do is at least separate those patients out that are have tricuspid insufficiency because they have tricuspid endocarditis because they're drug addicts, or the patients that have severe pulmonary embolism and market uh, increase in pulmonary artery, pulmonary artery pressures responsible for tricuspid in, insufficiency. Uh, that was done in this uh, prospective multi-center single arm trial that was performed in Germany on patients that have pretty severe tricuspid insufficiency. And probably most of these patients have tricuspid insufficiency because they have left ventricular disease and some degree of pulmonary artery hypertension. So I looked how these patients were screened and selected uh, and who was excluded uh, and uh, who then received these clips. And that's outlined here. And so here are the results. 
uh, did these patients that were clipped get better? Well, there wasn't a control group in this study, so we have to compare these patients' values uh, to um, uh, their values uh, when they were entered into the study. And that was done here, and the authors argue that the patients got some better. So if we look at the degree of regurgitation that they had, um, baseline, some had torrential tri tricuspid uh, insufficiency, some had massive, some had mo moderate, some had mild. And if we look six months later, it looks like the patients that ha had mild or moderate stayed about the same, but the patients that had severe or torrential um, tricuspid insufficiency looks like they got some better. That's what the argu arguments that the authors make. And if we look at the statistics, the variability in these patients is massive, but each patient serves as his own control. So this is a repeated measures analysis of variance without a control group. The authors argue that the patients might have got some better. Major adverse events, the authors claim not many. So much for that. The next topic in the Lancet is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is very common in patients that have that are overweight, which is a lot of us, patients that have pre-diabetes, or patients that have type 2 diabetes. And some of these patients have liver disease that's severe enough that they progress to developing cirrhosis. And is there anything that can be done about that aside from weight loss or perhaps gastric bypass? Well, I really didn't know any of this, but what I learned is that um, thyroid hormone has more than one receptor. There are two thyroid hormone receptors that are classified alpha or beta they're encoded by different genes, ones on chromosome 17 and ones on chromosome 3, and presumably they have different functions. And in this study, there's an agonist that's been developed against thyroid hormone receptor beta, which presumably mediates things other than what results in symptomatic hyperthyroidism, which would be unacceptable for patients with, that have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And this is what this drug looks like. I, the only information that I got on this drug is from the manufacturer. So this compound hasn't even made Wikipedia, at least not this week. But at any rate, in this 36 week study, patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease were randomized in a double blind placebo controlled fashion to a thyroid receptor beta agonist compared to placebo. And so here's a little more information on this that I got out of the Lancet paper and how the study was designed. At least we have a control group here. And there, uh, this is a two to one randomization. So uh, uh, two thirds of these patients got active compound and one third got placebo. Uh, the condition affects men and women equally. Uh, they have a generous body mass index, as you can imagine, 34 and 36 respectively. Uh, they weigh around 100 kilos. They have a waist circumference that's more than 100 centimeters, 100 centimeters, et cetera, et cetera. Now, similar to basic science, where we always show our best Western blots, we also show our best MRIs and uh, fatty liver can be diagnosed with MRI and it looks like these patients got this one example at least got better. And if we look at compared to the placebo group, the patients that got the thyroid hormone receptor beta agonist certainly had a substantial decrease in the amount of fat in their livers according to magnetic resonance imaging. And so uh, if, uh, it looks like the drug beat placebo by goodly margin. And um, uh, here are the patients that had at least a 30% fat reduction. Now this is fat in the liver, not fat in the body. Uh, and um, so 
LDL cholesterol is also better. HDL cholesterol went up a little bit with the treatment and liver enzymes. Looks like they might have gotten a bit better also. And uh, liver biopsies were performed in these patients. And uh, uh, these liver biopsies were then also evaluated for fat content. And um, um, biopsy responder analysis looks that like the authors might have anything, might have something. Patients with emergence adverse events that so that the drug had to be discontinued. Um, well, 5% versus 7% doesn't look too bad. Moderate adverse effects, 32% in both groups. Mild events, statistically not different between the groups. So this compound might have something to offer for people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. The review in The Lancet is on muscular dystrophies. And this is a complex series of severe genetic diseases, the worst of which is Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And uh, here's an entire listing of uh, these various muscular dystrophies and the genetic causes and the proteins that are involved. And uh, you can have a look at this. This is dystrophin. And um, this is an X-linked uh, disease. So that it's basically a disease of male children. Uh, there are some putative treatments, but my muscle expert tells me that these are not that convincing. And uh, the various gene mutations with these entire series of muscular dystrophies is shown here and what the biopsy results look like. And um, MRI evaluation, uh, Becker's is a dystrophin disease that's not quite as severe as the disease that was, was described by Duchenne. Uh, limb girdle, uh, fascio scapulo humeral muscular dystrophies, magnetic resonance imaging gives a pretty good idea what the diagnosis is. And um, these patients are then evaluated in terms of how far they, they, can, they can walk. And because the treatments for these conditions are all unsatisfactory, the patients get worse as they increase in age and the various therapeutic modalities that are being evaluated as shown in this comprehensive table. Then we have a 68 year old woman who comes in with pain in her left hip. Actually that plain film, I'm not an expert in reading these darn uh, MRIs, but this plain film helps me more than the MRI uh, because this patient looks like she has aseptic necrosis. We find out uh, that although she has rheumatoid arthritis and was, uh, she hadn't received corticosteroids and corticosteroids is certainly associated with aseptic necrosis of the hip. But this patient had also had carcinoma of the anus and she had received external beam pelvic radiotherapy. And that condition can also be associated with aseptic necrosis of the hip joint. And that's the story here what the authors discuss. Then I wanted to show you this patient in the New England Journal. It's a 57 year old woman that has a facial rash and goes to a dermatologist. The history indicates a 42 pack year history of cigarette smoking and that's relevant. Now, I first thought this patient probably has rosacea but then I would expect her nose to be primarily involved and her entire face, face is involved. And I'm not aware that uh, rosacea causes this, has a rash appearance in this uh, uh, area of the skin shown here, or that the hands would be involved or the buttocks. And so we're given more history and she has hypothyroidism and anxiety and re receives a palette of various drugs from probably various doctors. And she's got this 42 pack year history of smoking. So if we look at this blood work, not too helpful. Uh, neutrophils are slightly increased. White cell count is slightly increased. She has an inflammatory process. 
15,000 white cells. And then we're offered, is this systemic lupus erythematosus? I don't think so. Uh, not told anything about renal disease or proteinuria or this sort of thing. That was negative. Uh, is this rosacea? I'm not aware of rosacea occurring on the buttocks. Is this seborrheic dermatitis? I don't think so. And the only thing that we're left with is, is dermatomyositis, but we weren't told anything about muscle disease. But that's the only thing that might possibly fit. Now, why would this woman with 42 pack years have derma dermatomyositis if she doesn't have myositis? And then we learn that there's an amyopathic dermatomyositis. That's the derm part without the muscle part. So what? And uh, we can look at dermatomyositis, skin involvement without clinical myositis, and then we can look at this and we can perform additional studies. And one of the things we might think about is that this is a cancer-related syndrome. And indeed, that's likely to be the case. 20% uh, of adult patients with classic or amyopathic dermatomyositis have cancer. And with um, 42 pack years, we might get a chest X-ray or perhaps even better, an MRI scan, computerized tomography, or even a PET scan. And that was done. And this woman's lymph nodes were biopsied and she has a small cell lung cancer. And did as people with small cell lung cancer generally do, not very well. That's it for this week. Join me next week for more fascinating information from our favorite journals. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to hear all this. Yeah, danke, no. Bitte, bitte. Acht Minuten geht's weiter. <laughs>